Hey, everybody, and hello, Jacqueline Fletcher Johnson, my guest for today here on the Living Experiment podcast. Lovely to have you, Jackie. I'm so glad to be here. This is going to be a blast. It is. It's always a blast when we get together. I always feel like it's revisiting all of the many times we spent as friends chit chatting and talking. And I should say, it's often that the guests on this podcast are people who Dallas and or I know as friends, and we're lucky to have such brilliant friends. But it's unusual for me to have a friend guest on the podcast who I've known as long as I have known you, Jackie, and who have, with whom I have collaborated as much over the years. Um, so thank you for being my friend all of these years. Oh, you're so welcome and thank you. It's been, I just can't believe how long it's been. I was thinking about that the other day and I was like feeling so lucky to have you in my life and just to have that longevity, it feels so good. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah, my pleasure. Well, you know, it's interesting when I was thinking about, we've been planning to have you on the podcast for the longest time. And, you know, Dallas and I, like everyone else had our whole lives turned on their ears by COVID and much more, but we haven't been broadcasting in the studio, which we did for four years. And at the beginning of the lockdown with pandemic fun, we began doing these live COVID edition episodes that are do we're doing by video, which we don't normally do, and broadcasting live, which we don't normally do. But also, you know, talking with people in ways that are our guests, at least, that are more casual and more of the moment. And the topic that we're covering today, a topic, your title, The Art of the Return, um, I think is so timely and one that I really welcome the opportunity to to speak with you about as a friend, as well as a really trusted expert on the topic. So um, I'll set this up a little bit for folks just by saying Jackie is beyond being a great friend, a very accomplished professional who's an award-winning author. Uh, I consider a real expert in self-mastery and healing um, and an accomplished speaker and teacher as well. And uh, I have so many of your books by the bedside, but just a handful of them. The Dear Body series is one of my favorites. You have written more books than anybody I know. <laughs> <laughs> Many of which on this topic of, of self-awareness and self-healing and self-mastery. And you've also done a bunch of other cool stuff like um, TV show for Mayo Clinic TV on uh, writing by the bedside and lots of other multimedia projects and stage performances that all kind of investigate this intersection of personal wisdom and healing and giving our best gifts back to the world, which I, I think is a great place to kind of segue into what we're talking about today. But have I left anything really important out of your bio? Whatever, it's someone I know. I feel like I probably <laughs> forgot like your Nobel Prize winning something or other. <laughs> uh, no, that sounds pretty darn good. Yeah, I mean, it's really, that's been my life's work is really working on how do we be, you know, the best version of ourselves and how do we get back on our feet uh, when yeah. we go through something hard. And so, yeah, so now it, it's just more poignant than ever. <laughs> Yeah, well, and it's interesting, you know, in terms of overcoming adversity and difficulty and navigating that space. Um, one thing I mentioned in the intro on our web page or on our Facebook page is that you've been through quite a lot. I mean, in the past and more recently, um, you know of what you speak, as they say, uh, you know, you lost 100 pounds and kept that off and went through all of the body mind navigations and negotiations that involved. Um, and then more recently, you diagnosed with breast cancer in the middle of the coronavirus and somehow managed to turn that into the cancer and coronavirus comedy show. <laughs> Did I get the title right or something like that? <laughs> the Holy you. crap, I got cancer during the coronavirus comedy show. <laughs> Holy crap, I got cancer during the coronavirus. Uh -huh. Yeah, which got was really, uh, people can still find the episodes of like Baby Monk and the comedy uh, show that you did through your uh, dedicated Facebook page, I believe. I don't remember the exact title, but we can post that. It's linked to from your page, I would assume, if I get your... Um, it is, yep. And it's at CC Comedy Show. So it's just on Facebook, on Facebook. at that handle, yeah. CC Comedy Show. Okay, yeah. that's great. Yep. Um, 
Yeah. So like, let's talk a little bit about that voyage and how it brought you to, I know you've recently been doing a course around self-mastery and the art of return, but draw a little line for me, if you would, from this past year that you've been through, which is like <laughs> harder than even most people's years, which is saying a lot, and where you've come at now, what you're excited about sharing from that body of wisdom. Yeah, well, um, so I started uh, this journey through the coronavirus um, as somebody who was teaching resilience workshops and teaching self-mastery workshops and training people in burnout prevention and how to get back on their feet. Uh, so I, and this was stuff I had lived my whole life as you as you previously mentioned. Um, so I I have a large toolkit. Uh, of things that I use when I'm feeling not great. And of course, the reason that I have that toolkit is because I'm a human and I fall down a lot. Uh, and so what happened was last, I'm laughing, it's not funny, but- um, <laughs> <laughs> We'll laugh anyway. If you don't laugh, you're gonna cry, you know? Right, exactly. So uh, last fall, um, I was just in bed one morning, just stretching and waking up. Uh, and with, it was so bizarre. It was, you know, a lot of women say, describe that this, that this is how it happens. I wasn't checking my breasts. I wasn't doing exams. I wasn't doing any of that. I'm kind of lazy about that. And I would forget it a lot. Uh, and I had skipped my mammogram for a few years. Uh, and so I was in bed this, this one morning stretching, uh, about a week before Thanksgiving in 2019. And I, um, my hand just without my consciousness just went right mm -hmm. to this lump. Mm -hmm. And it was a big one. Uh, and I felt this lump in my, my left breast and I just knew instantly that it was really, it was not gonna be good. Um, and so it, I had to wait for a long time to get in to see the doctor. It was the holidays. When I got to my doctor, she was uh, somebody I had never seen before because mine had retired. And so I was in with this uh, stranger who uh, at the beginning was really, really brusque. And by the end was super nice. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that's really not good. Um, yeah. She said, I'm going to call the breast center right now and see if they can get you in this afternoon. Um, and so uh, I knew that that was not good. Um, and it took, it took about a month to get through all the tests. Um, and then on Friday the 13th of December, <laughs> uh, found out it was breast cancer. And, uh, and it, was, it was off to the races. Um, I've often described it as, as uh, to friends who are really worried if they feel something and they go in for tests and the doctors are like, yeah, we don't know, we'll, we'll try to do this. Once they figure out what's going on and, they, and they're concerned, they put you in a shoot. And it's just like, whoo, and in you go. And uh, so they, they'll tell you if they, if they think it's serious as the experience that I had. Of course, they miss things all the time, but yeah. uh, that was my experience. And so I was then uh, put in this shoot. That happened at the same time that uh, the coronavirus was spreading in, out of Wuhan. Uh, and I was uh, having conversations with a friend of mine, Arcadia Kim, and. Uh, Hong Kong at the time, and she was telling me what was happening and the lockdowns that were happening in Hong Kong. And um, and so so I went into treatment in January uh, to for chemotherapy and immunotherapy and was in treatment for about five months. And uh, what I found through that experience was that um, it was it's this it, it was an experience that just stripped me. Uh, down to uh, my essence. And I had to really, you know, and people talk about this with crises, you know, it really takes you to a place of really being naked uh, as a human and having to put yourself back together. And what I found was this really surprising journey through the things that um, I needed in order to get through it. And so I took deep, compassionate care of myself. Um, I had a lot of people say to me things like, um, I just need to give you a little tough love. Thank you so much for helping all of us. It's your turn to ask for help. 
Mm. And I had a lot of friends say, you're not going to be good at that. And that was true. <laughs> it was very hard for me to ask for help. Yeah. It was hard for me to, um, to be that vulnerable. When I first found out, I had this very strong instinct to keep it to myself. I didn't want to tell anyone because I saw it as a weakness. I saw it as a failure on my part. Uh, and so a lot of the work I had to do to get through this was I had to really allow myself, A, to feel all the feelings and to really go through whatever feelings I was having. If I was afraid, I had to look it in the face and feel it. If I was angry, I had to look that in the face and feel it. Um, if I didn't want to be with people, you know, certain people, because it was so exhausting, I... I chose not to be with those people because it was too tiring. And so this was this was hard and it was hard on the people around me who were going through this journey with me. Um, and so I would say that uh, what I discovered through this is I called in all of the resources I knew about. I was using mindfulness. I was meditating. I was taking hot baths. I was sleeping and taking naps. I was calling my friends when I was scared or my family members. I was doing all of these things that we know helps resilience. Um, but there was this huge gap in what I uh, was doing. Even though I taught it before, it was more of an intellectual exercise. <laughs> Oh, I can relate to that. <laughs> I got it all figured out up here. <laughs> I got it really figured out in my head. Yes, but chopped off at the neck and was not actually practice. I like to practice what I preach. I love to actually practice what I'm teaching. I really kind of work to do that. But there was one area of my life that I was lacking, and it was one that I continually lack over and over and over again, and I have to be so conscious of it. And it was this idea of fun and pleasure and laughter. And it became so clear to me when I had to look, you know, I've been describing it as a near death experience because I didn't die and come back, but I, I had to look at, I could die. And, yeah. and so, so in that regard, it really was this near death experience. And so I was thinking, you know, that's what I looked at this time as I was like, what do I want to what do I want to leave with? What do I want to stand for? What do I want my life to have meant? And so as I was thinking all of these thoughts, um, there was one night where uh, I was preparing to go in for a double whammy treatment. I was getting chemotherapy and immunotherapy the next day, and I was afraid of it um, because it just took me out. It took me down for a good seven days. Oof. And uh, I would get these fevers of 104 degrees and all over body pain and like chattering teeth that I couldn't control. And mm -hmm. then my, I would just cry for like, I wasn't sad. I wasn't, you know, I would just, my body would cry. Like it was trying to release toxins. I mean, it was just such a bizarre experience. And it would, it would hit me usually in the middle of the night. So I would wake up kind of feeling the onset of the symptoms the night after I got the treatment that evening. So, um, so I got up, I couldn't sleep the night before, it was about three o'clock in the morning, and I made a video that I posted on my private Facebook page for my friends and family. And I was like, I am up in the middle of the night. I am really scared. And when I was little, and I was really scared, I would tell myself stories, or I would ask, you know, the people around me, my adults in my life to, to tell me stories, and they would make me feel better. Uh, and so I asked my friends and family to tell me a story in the comments of the post. Uh, just, you know, people would add a sentence or a paragraph at a time like you used to do when you were in kindergarten. And so what happened was then the next day I was sitting in this cold gray plastic chair in the Masonic Cancer Center and um, had the IV going and the drip uh, of chemo into my veins. and. Um, I was on my phone looking at Facebook, watching the story being told by my friends and family. Mm. And it was so beautiful and it made me feel so loved and it was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. It was so funny. And so I was just laughing through the whole thing. 
And so that night, um, I knew I was going to wake up with the symptoms. I, I went to bed and about two or three o'clock in the morning, I felt, you know, the fever start to come in. And the minute I woke up, instead of dreading it and kind of tightening up everything and being like, oh God, here we go, here we go. Instead, what happened was I started to laugh because I remembered the story. And all of a sudden, like I was in the middle of laughing and I was like, oh my gosh, it would be so funny if I made a comedy show called The Holy Crap, I Got Cancer During the Coronavirus Comedy Show. And I made little videos. <laughs> and just did it for myself only to make myself laugh that would be hilarious and so um so then i started laughing even more and so then i got up because i couldn't sleep and i started brainstorming all these ridiculous things i could do um and just kept laughing and so finally went to bed and got a little bit of sleep and then the next morning i woke up and I'm because I was I was in a trial for the immunotherapy, uh, and so I had to track all of my symptoms through the whole thing, really carefully. And so I knew these details about the 104 fever and all that. And so I noticed that my fever had only gotten to 102, mm. and I was like, "Wow, that's really interesting." And my pain wasn't as bad. So um, I called my brother, one of my brothers, and I told him this idea about this ridiculous show. And wouldn't it be funny if we did these skits like we used to do when we were kids? And wouldn't that be funny? And we just laughed for like 45 minutes, brainstormed some more ideas. And by the end of the call, I had no fever and no pain. And it went away for like two hours. Wow. Yeah. So I was like, this is bizarre. So then what happened was that I, because I live in my head most of the time, <laughs> I decided I was going to um, try, you know, have this be like a little mini study of one. Uh, so I, you know, the, I let the symptoms all come back. I didn't let them, they just did. Uh, and then I called a friend of mine and did the same thing. Fever was 102 at the beginning of the call, had all of her body pain told him about my idea, we laughed. And at the end, no fever, no pain for two hours. And I did it one more time. I tried it three times. <laughs> <laughs> You're a little clinical trial there. <laughs> exactly. It's pretty classic, yeah. So <laughs> so then it worked again all three times. And I was like, "This is there's something to this. And of course yeah. I'd heard you know, the research on laughter and, <clears throat> excuse me, the benefits of laughter in the body and how it releases Norman all Cousins this. and all of that stuff. Yeah, yes. right. Exactly. So, um, but I had never really experienced it for myself, but I started to, you know, I read Norman Cousins' book and went down that uh, little rabbit hole. And so then I just decided, well, I'm going to start this little comedy show. And I started making videos I started singing again. I hadn't sung since I was in my 20s and I love to sing. I made these little, you know, comedies with Baby Monk, who you mentioned, because <clears throat> Baby Monk is basically from Snapchat, the baby filter. Yes. Because I had no hair and no eyebrows and no <laughs> eyelashes, I looked exactly like a baby. And oh, so wow. I thought that was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. And so I was like, oh, that'd be so funny if I just had like ancient baby wisdom and like said really wise things in my voice with a baby face. <laughs> well, you weren't the only one who apparently thought it was hilarious. Got picked up by the Minneapolis St. Paul paper. A bunch of my friends were like forwarding those things like, oh my gosh, Jackie has like busted into a whole new <laughs> comedy routine about coronavirus and cancer. But with like this classic Jackie Fletcher angle of like a little life wisdom in there too. And yeah, you know, it, it, it's so fascinating to think about how you were experimenting using all of these skills that you have. You know, you're a performer and a creative and you, you leverage your relationships with other people in, in inter intricate networks in ways that it makes sense to me that you would be using all of these tools to get you through this unendurably difficult experience and then land on something that actually ends up bringing a whole bunch of other people mirth and pleasure at the same time. Classic artist personality, that's so great. What can I say? Yeah, I mean, it was really beautiful. I was so struck by um, what happened, you know, after the, 
Star Tribune uh, ran the article. It was, I just got, I got letters, you know, from all sorts of people uh, afterward. And there was one in particular that was just, uh, I started bawling after I got it because it was this woman who, um, her husband had died in April in her arms at home. Mm -hmm. And she told me, you know, I read this article and because I saw what you could do and you could stand up, I can too. And wow. I just, you know, that's, that is the work that I want to do in the world. And, you know, as I was working to recover, uh, I read this just magnificent book uh, called The Choice by Dr. Edith Eva Egger. And she's a Holocaust survivor. She's like, she published her first book at 90. She published her second book at 94 um, or 92 or something like that. But, um, and she wrote this beautiful memoir about um, her life and her time at Auschwitz. Yeah. And she wrote about this time where she had been rescued and um, Oh, it was just, you know, in, she was in such bad shape and she was in the hospital and she was lying in bed and she just, she, she described it almost like it was this voice from outside of herself that kind of rose up into her. And she said she had this thought come through her mind that was, if you live, you must stand for something. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so I felt that all the way to my bones. Um, and I've always been big on purpose and meaning, but but reading that, having cancer in the middle of the coronavirus, it just spoke to me on so many levels. And it spoke to you know what we're all going through right now. We're all in this just tremendous period of chaos and pain and agony and burnout. And it's so hard right now for everyone. And so, um, so that was something that I've really been playing with. And you know, when I got my scan, it was like, "Yay, cancer free!" I was like, "Yes!" <laughs> and whoa, now what? <laughs> now what? And I went into a lot of people who go through medical crises describe this, which I wasn't prepared for, but they go through this depression yeah. uh, afterward. And I hit it hard, um, and just was like, "What?" what am I going to do with my life? Like, where am I and who am I? And what does this mean? And, and I, I wanted to re-examine everything in my life. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. I started really looking at, do I, do I want to do the work I'm doing? Do I want to just go get, you know, um, a job that doesn't require so much of me? Yeah. Do I want to move? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do I want to uh, just hit the road for a while? Like I examined every possible thing in my life, every relationship, uh, like I mentioned earlier. And was it something that was life-giving or not? Yeah. Um, and that was really surprising to me. The other most surprising thing I think that happened was this discovery of really having to set firm boundaries. Mm -hmm. And not only with with other humans or with um, you know organizations that I'm working with, for instance, but setting firm boundaries with myself around, yeah, no, honey, you're gonna rest right now. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna keep working. You're gonna take a nap. Mm -hmm. um, and really being so gentle with myself, that was a really big shift um, in my world. And it's one that I continue to, now that I'm back to work, it's one I continue to have to manage myself on every single day. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Wow. It's so, I'm, as you're talking about this, I'm reflecting, I've had, I think, no fewer than five friends di diagnosed with cancer in the past year and a half or so, or, or going through treatment. And um, many of them have talked about this sort of identity crisis and the strange intersection of feeling like on the one hand, like devastating um, diagnoses in some cases, really uncertain prognosis. And at the same time, feeling a certain like j get out of jail free card feeling of like, well, now I have this cancer card. If you know, I, I don't want to do something or I want permission to be 
free to change something about my life, like I, I can do that now, that there's almost an unfolding of oneself that, you know, you, all of the ways you felt constrained, maybe now you feel less constrained. But at the same time, I have heard that story too before of like, then when they're, you know, cured or healed or in remission, there's this strange convergence of the former reality, like, does it come creeping back in? You can't really ever fold yourself back up into the same shape to fit into that old box. But now what? And and maybe that's, you know, in talking about the art of the return, in some ways, this is this critical moment of like, okay, I've come through. And let's talk about that from a hero's journey standpoint, because I think that at least is a reference point for this that I want to make sure people get, because um, you and I are both students of literature and big fans of Joseph Campbell. But yeah. talk about, you know, where this leaves you relative to this hero's journey and what the return is about. And then let's talk about specifically the strategies or tactics that you can use to, to make for a better, <laughs> more skillful turn and return. Yeah, absolutely. So when I first started working on this book, it was before any of this happened. And it was called The Art of the Return because I was referring to mindfulness. Like when we return to our breath over and over and over again, that's what we do. It's just about this return. And it was about this concept, which you know about, where um, when I was losing weight, losing these hundred pounds, um, what I what it what really turned it around for me was that I had decided that there was no such thing as failure, and that every morning I was just going to return to my intention to be healthier. And so what it did for me was that it helped me um, stop the inner destruction of negative thoughts. Um, and so that's what the book was going to be about was this idea of this art of returning yeah. just again and again. So it was really about consciousness building and awareness building, um, which is what, you know, self mastery is made of where, where the beautiful Joseph Campbell's return story and the hero's journey. Um, I think you'll really appreciate this comes into this. And um, th the book is still about that. It's still about how do we return to our feet? How do we return to our purpose and passion when we've been through something hard? Um, mindfulness is still a big part of the book, but, uh, but now there's a new flavor, a new level to the book that was not there uh, when I started writing it last year. And there was an experience that I had in the middle of all of this that I think I, I, think I told you in the middle of it, but um, forgive me if I didn't, um, where I was having vivid dreams and vivid visions when I was meditating. Um, I was on all kinds of drugs, of doing all kinds of things in my body. And uh, so there was, uh, I think it was a meditation that I was doing, but I can't be sure. It might have been a dream. But I remember vividly that I was, oh, it was two different experiences. This is what it was. So the first thing that happened was I was on these really intense drugs. I had come home. I was felt awful because it was one of the days of big treatments. And my daughter came into the bedroom and she, you know, was avoiding me. She's 12 years old. She was avoiding me a little bit when I was really, really sick. But she came in that afternoon to, to see me and I was kind of out of it. I was really loopy on whatever drugs I was on. And I was like, Eva, I am in the underworld and I am collecting the gifts and I am going to return to the village to share the gifts. <laughs> which of course is the the hero's journey. Like you you take this journey to the underworld, you collect the gifts and you return and share them with other people. That's that's part of the story. And so I, I, I said that to her when I was super drugged up on all of these drugs. Um, and then the vision that I had in this dream or meditation, whichever it was, I was actually sitting on a throne of lava mm. in some underworld place. And I had this 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 whip of light in my hand that I was going like out into my body and it was cracking through the cancer cells and busting them up and exploding them and destroying them. And like I had, I think I had whips in both hands like Indiana Jones and I was just like, wah, wah. And, like, um, and so that was my other experience of the underworld during the cancer journey. Um, and so, but now what the art of the return really means to me is that I really looked at it from what did I, what did I use to return from this journey? 
And if I look at my whole life, um, because I've had to return, as I've said many, many times from all sorts of things, because I like to just mess my life up, life up in really big ways as an artist and then have to put it back together. And so I looked at these buckets of what those things are. Uh, and for me, the big buckets are um, mindfulness and this ability to develop self-awareness through mindfulness. It is expression, so the ability to express yourself and express your feelings as they're happening so that you don't get them stuck in your body. Mm. Um, a lot of people, a lot of my friends uh, and family and colleagues are like, gosh, you just seem fine. Like you seem amazing after this experience you had. I'm like, yeah, cause I went through it mm. and I felt every minute of it as I went through it. And there will still be moments that I'll process back, you know, through things, but I felt it, I wrote about it, I talked about it. Um, and so that really, really helped. Um, I think the experience of fun and pleasure and laughter is a really huge resilience tool that I completely skipped over. Yeah. <laughs> um, that finally I get it. So I think that's part of the return uh, for me when I am teaching now through this new work that I'm just developing now. Um, I think that another really big one is awe. Mm. What, I, what I experienced was multiple times throughout this journey was this just profound sense of being so connected to other people in a way I never had before. Yeah being so cared for, being such a part of all that is, that I just felt profound awe about life itself. And so, you know, whether you call that God or a higher spirit or a higher being or, a, you know, the energy of the universe, that, that doesn't really matter to me. What matters to me is this sense that there's something larger than yourself yeah. And knowing that and connecting to that, however you do that, is such a powerful resilience tool. Mm. And where it there was one moment where it really came into play vividly where I was going in for a surgery and I was scared. I had never been through these big surgeries before. And I had a friend who gave me a really, uh, she gave me really good advice. Her name is Cheryl Salter. She's a fantastic healing touch practitioner. A little shout out for Cheryl. Um, she works primarily with breast cancer patients in Minneapolis. And she said, you know what, honey, when you go lie down on that cold metal slab of a table, she said, just, just imagine that you're lying back into the arms of an angel when you lie back. And... Mm -hmm. That's gonna bring me to tears, but um, I did that. And as I did that, I could feel like in my mind, in my body, in my emotions, in my spirit, like I could feel Cheryl wrap her arms around me. I could feel this warmth, you know, whether it was an actual angel or whether it was my imagination, I don't know, but I felt so protected and so loved. And so it, it helped tremendously for me to just remember that as I was lying back into this experience. Mm. So those are some of the, some of the big ones that I, t I teach a lot. Yeah. Um, and, and I find that as I work with people through their experiences, um, that those buckets are what we, we all go through in our different ways. Um, and that's what I love about them too, is that they rely on you to be your own ancient wise one. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. That's yeah. So, well, and I, I do listening to you talk about it, you know, I'm, I'm reflecting again on the different ways that different friends have expressed different parts of those truths, you know, and what they've discovered as they've moved through not just cancer, but other really devastating experiences and losses in this past year, you know, 2020 was just so brutally difficult on so many people for so many reasons. Yeah. Um, but it's like, you know, how do you take 
how do you find, how do you locate some good in any of this? And it's less about like going on a hunt for it than I think it is about having so much of the rest of what we normally wrap ourselves in by way of distraction or, you know, presentation of self or achieving our goals. Like when all of that gets ripped away, you're left looking at like, well, what is there left, you know, and, yeah. and what emerges from the wreckage of that, that you you can put your hand on because there's nothing else there. You know, it's like, this is what I have to work with right now. And those, sometimes those gifts are greater than the, often they are greater than the things that you now are bemoaning the loss of, you know, like you're, you know, people say like they lose their health, but then they discover their love or their, their connection with something greater or a, a sense of purpose that they didn't have before. Um, you know, people losing their jobs and discovering that there's something else that they feel called to do that they haven't had a chance to even experience because they've been so busy, you know, pushing on that career. And it's interesting, and you know, Dallas and I have talked about this a lot too, that it's forced so many of us to really radically reconsider our priorities in the context of relative chaos. You know, what are the constants that matter? And I think what you refer to, you know, that sense of connection, um, you know, finding pleasure and play and, and you know, like some, some kind of joy in the midst of so much misery or locating awe and that sense of the magic that is, exists within us and, you know, in nature and in our own body minds, um, that those things often have more meaning and more gratification in them than the things that we've been holding so tightly to and chasing. We've been so busy holding tight and chasing that we haven't even noticed that they're available to us. Um, you know, I think about, you know, and so often people reference these stories of the Holocaust or Viktor Frankl's lessons or, um, many other, well, there are not unfortunately on many, many other survivors, but so many people who came through that experience with any part of themselves intact seem to have made it their life's purpose to translate the lessons of, you know, the last human freedoms that we have or choosing to make your life then worthwhile, like feeling the burden of returning with gifts rather than just returning and going right back to your regularly scheduled program, which, you know, I, I, I can see on the one hand, the temptation that there would be to do that. Like let's return to the comfort of so-called normalcy. But I think all of us know whether you've been through like a major health crisis, like the one that you have, or like just the kind of run of the mill crisis that it is now so widely shared, most people don't really want to go back to so-called normal. Certainly there are elements we'd like to, like, oh, it would be so nice to be able to go to Bev's wine bar and just have a glass of wine with a girlfriend. I miss that. Yes, I miss that a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, oh, remember, we just like casually go out for Thai yeah. food, I was saying to my friend. But at the same time, you know, I don't think I want to get folded back up quite the way that I was before yeah. all of this, even absent. You know, I've been fortunate to, to have my health through all of this, but man, witnessing what all of my friends and family have been through has left me changed. And um, yeah. yeah. So when people, you know, come to you for this wisdom, you know, okay, Jackie, you've been through breast cancer and the coronavirus, and you've been like somehow steadily creating, whether you've like put pen to paper or, um, you know, dreams <laughs> to dreams to life. Like what counsel would you give someone who is um, kind of on their last frayed nerve right about now, you know, it doesn't know where their next paycheck is coming from, or doesn't know how they're going to manage, you know, school kids being home while they're trying to work from home, or who doesn't know where their next paychecks are coming from, or just is dealing with their own health problems. Like how would you counsel somebody to get started in, I guess, identifying a way into the return, you know, not that you can rush that, I guess, either, but like, how would you counsel somebody to navigate from here? Well, I would say that the very first thing is to, uh, to work on just this deep sense of self-compassion mm -hmm. through it. Um, you know, and so a lot of times I will actually put my hands on my body somewhere. I'll put my hands on my heart. I'll put my hands somewhere on my body that making me feel really comforted. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for some people that's on their cheeks, for some people it's on their forehead, some people it's kind of over the heart, some people it's above the heart. Um, 
some people with solar plexus and like the low belly. Mm. Um, and a, a woman that I worked with, she, you know, for her, it was putting her hands on her thighs, like these strong, strong thighs. So it's, you know, very often when I'm really freaking out like that, um, and for anyone who is, it's like, let's put the hands on the body and just start to come into your body, into the present. And I always recommend the breath to just slow the body down and to just take those ni nice deep breaths and to just notice the breath. That's all. And just to try to calm the physiology down, calm the animal body down, um, but to do it with just deep love and self-compassion. And so that's why I, I like to start people. Sometimes self-compassion is really hard for people, um, but, but that's where we start. And so sometimes people have to keep their hands off their body, but kind of put them close to their bodies um, if they have struggles with their bodies. But um, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing I would I very often recommend as a very early tool is, um, especially if you're in an acute period, um, it's a very simple practice. You've heard about it before, but um, I like to add something to it. So um, it's a gratitude practice that I um, started a couple of years ago where um, I write down in my journal every single day um, things from the last 24 hours that I'm grateful for. Mm. And what's really interesting about that is that, and of course, as you probably know from the research, is that it trains me to look for things to be grateful for so that I know that tomorrow I'm going to do this again and um, I need to look for those things. And so um, when I hit the cancer diagnosis, I was already doing that practice, but I had um, added to it this other layer, which for me was really powerful and empowering which was to write down three things I wanted to invite into my life. I wanted more of, um, and that was super empowering for me. Um, so I felt like I had some sense of agency, some control over my life. Um, and it also kind of programmed my subconscious mind to do things to get me toward those invitations. Um, and so how that played out was that when I got the cancer diagnosis for the first three days, I freaked out. <laughs> I was terrified. I was writing in my journal, like just this outpouring of fear and just, I mean, it was just fear. And by the, but by the third day, I just, th that third morning I woke up and I just went right back to my gratitude practice without even thinking about it. I just started the practice again um, because I had trained myself to do that. Um, so that's that's one that I recommend that's so simple um, for people who are really in the middle of the struggle. Um, I just, I absolutely love that one. Um, and then I would say the other one is not gonna be as popular. <laughs> Fair warning. Uh, <laughs> Fair warning. Uh, but I would say um, the third thing that has helped me so much, and I think that we've kind of gotten away from as a society to our detriment is to work with a trained therapist. Yeah. And uh, I started working with a psychotherapist who is well-versed in somatic experiencing, which is the body, bringing the body into that work. And it has been absolutely transformational for me. And I've worked with coaches and I love coaches and I've done all of that work, but True therapy is something that we've left behind as more and more of us um, opt for other ways of feeling better. Uh, and so it's it's out of vogue. Mm. But it is one of the most uh, powerful tools, I think, for true, real transformation. Um, and so that that's kind of the third thing I guess I'd recommend for people um, who are really in the middle of it is to get help because yeah. there's help out there uh, and you don't have to do it alone. Yeah, I know. I think that there's some, and there are a lot of resources now, um, I don't want to say thanks to COVID, but there are more resources available now for mental health support for folks who don't have a lot of financial resources. Some yes. very highly skilled therapists who are volunteering and making themselves available through various programs. Um, yes. So that it may be more accessible now than it has ever been to get in for a series of appointments to process whatever's going on with you. And frankly, you know, I think most of us are living in a post 
post-traumatic state just by virtue of living in our world. You know, um, the whole idea of the Living Experiment podcast is like, if you're choosing to be a healthy, happy person in our current culture, which is predominantly unhealthy and unhappy and sustaining of unhealthy, unhappy states, you're choosing a less traveled path. And, and it, it does take help um, from peers and, and experts and healers and support systems of various kinds to navigate in a way that is different than the way that most people, unfortunately, are going, which is predominantly around, you know, distraction, self-anesthesia, you know, self-medicating, whether it's with sugar or alcohol or you know, credit cards or <laughs> whatever it is. Like, and I have done all of those things. <laughs> all every the single one. one. Yeah, <laughs> we all have. Yeah, and that's what that's what becomes, in some ways, the most accessible solution is yeah. just please take me out of my pain body. Um, I will say too, you know, I interviewed Res Mamenicum on the show mm -hmm. um, a couple of years ago. I think 2019. And we did an episode on trauma. And he talked a lot about how we all carry cultural, racial, social, and physical trauma in our bodies as the result of the histories that we've been through and the histories of our ancestors. And that most of us never, ever deal with that. We just end up repeating these patterns of damage in our own lives and meeting them out unconsciously often and inadvertently, unwittingly in the lives of other people whom we touch. And it really struck me that, you know, every time we come through something like cancer or a death of a loved one or some major loss, if we come through doing our own healing work and with the self-compassion looking at like what what is going on with me that I need to be able to feel and process. Hey, and by the way, I just realized now we've got to, of all people, Kathy Werzer popping in, one of my favorite experts hey, on all Kathy. things. Kathy is a host of a morning show on uh, Minnesota Public Radio and also has a wonderful nonprofit called End in Mind, which is all about managing end of life decisions with consciousness. Kathy says, three things you wanted to invite into your life Love it, she says. And she goes, is that three things every day? Is this like, would you would you approve or suggest actually having a kind of cadence of these three different awarenesses or exercises? Um, Jackie, I think that's a question for you. Yeah, well, hi, Kathy. It's so good to have you here. Um, so the three things that I do every day, uh, I change them up uh, depending on the day, but some of them I keep on my list uh, for a long time. Uh, if it's something that I want to really create a lot of consciousness around. And so I will just have it on my list every morning. And just the act of writing it down every day brings, it's the, it's the return, right? It's returning me to consciousness around whatever that thing is. So I have one or two things that sometimes I just kind of repeat uh, over time. So for instance, a recent one that I've been repeating constantly is I invite in sleep because mm. I was struggling with sleep sleep after chemotherapy. This is a common thing. And uh, so I just in kept inviting it in, kept inviting it in, kept inviting it in every day. Um, and now I'm sleeping. I found some ways to some support. I worked with a, a woman who's a sleep expert and it was man you know, managed to kind of work and solve that. Um, but then I, it depends on the day. So um, I hope that answers the question. It's, it's sometimes I, I repeat myself and other times I, I invite in new things depending on where I'm at. Yeah, Jackie, thanks for the question. That is a great question. And Kathy, yeah. thank you so much for tuning in. It's an honor. I, Kathy, I'm a big fan of Kathy Werzer. Yeah. I'll say I listen to Kathy any old time. Um, and I will say too, you know, I think that the idea of just ritualizing any kind of self-comforting or self-focusing or awareness type of practice is, is a balm in a world that feels chaotic and yes. unpredictable. And when our bodies and minds are both operating, you know, in ways that we may not predict or understand. Mm -hmm. I often recommend a morning minutes practice, which is by virtue, is very intentionally non-structured. Like you can do anything. I suggest people for the first three minutes when they wake up, do this morning minutes practice. Like anything you want to do that lets you come to waking gradually, whether mm -hmm. that's journaling or watching the birds or doing yoga or reading 
a wisdom passage in a book or doodling or just, you know, like sitting and breathing and watching a candle burn. The idea that you can give yourself permission on different days to do what feels good to you on that day, I feel it. like really helps. It removes that barrier of like uh, every day I must get up and meditate for the next minutes and I must then do these other five things. And it becomes like a litany. <laughs> you right. Know? Exactly. Well, it's it's another pressure. thing to do. Yeah. 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 Well, Jackie, for folks who want to go deeper into this work and, you know, access some of this stuff, I think in addition to the book you're working on, I know you have a course about this. Are you doing that as a, like a live process or something that people can find recorded? Where do people learn more about the art of the return and the, the evolving work you have in that space? Well, there's a couple places. So they can go to my website, which is heartwoodhealing.com. Um, and they can sign up for the newsletter, which is actually heartwoodhealing.com slash subscribe. That's probably the best way to uh, learn of my work. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn at Jacqueline Fletcher Johnson. Um, and the course that I am teaching right now, um, it is live. And so I'll be running you know, different cohorts. So if you wanna do something uh, in the future with me, definitely sign up for that um, on my website. And then the book, The Art of the Return is underway. And um, writing it as often as I possibly can to get it out the door as quickly as I can. Um, and so that would be a great thing. If you sign up for the newsletter, you'll be uh, in the know about when that's ready for publication. Mm, that's wonderful. I posted the website, um, heartwoodhealing.com, and we'll make sure we link to that in the show notes as well. Um, I was going to mention too, you know, I, traditionally here on the Living Experiment podcast, we end each episode with suggested experiments, things that people can do in their own life to that reference some of the wisdom that we've shared in the previous uh, hour. And I realize you've given folks a bunch of things that they can try, but like, is there one experiment that you would love to suggest to someone? I'm thinking right now, I'm just imagining someone, like I'll, I'll use myself, <laughs> I'll just out myself. The past few months, I feel like I kind of got to this place where for all of my wonderful tools and all of my pro resilience practices, there have been days I've just been like, I cannot believe I'm still grinding away through the set of circumstances. And I just, I'm feeling at sea. Like, I don't know when this is ever going to end. Where is the light at the end of this tunnel? And I have my own practices, but sometimes it's really nice to go to someone else. And like, what would you prescribe for me? Jen? Mm, I love it. Well, uh, so what comes for me, uh, for you, is um, first of all, uh, this idea of being in the middle of uncertainty and being in the middle of the grind as it continues on um, and having that kind of weight that's just sitting on you, right? Because we're all living in this time of gr great uncertainty. And so what immediately comes to me is when we're living in that, a, how can you look, or, you know, one of the things I learned in the middle of this cancer journey was like, wait a minute, I have everything I need right now. And I really looked at my life and, and it, it became very simple. So like we talk, you brought this up earlier about, um, you know, the things that, that people understand that when it, everything gets stripped away yeah. and you really understand that like, wait a minute, the people I love are here um, there is light coming in the window right now that's beautiful. And so for me, what I would recommend is to look around the life that you have right now that's present for you, to look for where the light is coming in, mm -hmm. to look at the beauty that you've surrounded yourself with, um, the colors, the textures, and to really just savor all of that and immerse yourself in it. Um, that's what I would recommend for you. And one of the practices that I like to give too is to actually follow the light. So to just start noticing the light throughout the day, like where is it and what is it falling on in your home? Um, and just notice the quality of it and what it's looking like in the sky. And so that's I what I would that. recommend for you. Oh, I love that. And you're, this is your little psychism thing. Just today I was walking through the hallway and looked up into the stairwell and there was just this 
gorgeous light, like shining on these books that I'd recently polished the books. And it was just this glorious moment of like, you know, if there were going to be like little trumpet sounds or something, I was like, oh, it's gorgeous. And I think that savoring of good experiences is so often uh, like it's a missed opportunity for sweetness in our lives where we just always rushing to the next thing, including the next worry. You know, we run the litany of lists, the litany of worries, you know, now, okay, I'm done worrying about that. I got to worry about the next thing rather than appreciating the beauty that's there. Um, and I'll offer an experiment based on my own experience, uh, a successful experience this last week, thanks to my friend Heidi Wachter, who's one of my former colleagues from Experience Life magazine. She posted a lovely piece about bird feeders here in the Midwest where both Jackie and I are, where it's very been very cold. We've had a cold snap where it's been sometimes 20 below zero, which is hard on us as people, but it's also really hard on little animals that are outside. So the article that she shared was about how to support bird life in your neighborhood or in your backyard. Love it. Yeah, I've never, it. never been one to like have a bird house or bird feeders, but I went out and hung a bird feeder just thinking like, if there's nothing else I can do, I can at least make life, e life easier for some birds. <laughs> and I have to tell you that bird feeder just filled it up with bird seed from the hardware store. Then eventually <laughs> hung out a little bit of like suet or beef fat, you know, tallow, which they need when it's all. And Jackie, it has been amazing to see this like petting zoo of birds just show up. Like it's like a wildlife refuge in the backyard right now. Yeah. And that that little experiment for me is one I would recommend to anyone, whether it's a bird habitat or anything else, create a space where you're helping somebody or something or someone else. Mm -hmm. And then allow yourself to observe the benefit of that. You know, some people that means they, you know, are serving up food for meals on wheels or homeless shelters, or they're putting together packages for people that can't get out of their houses. For other people, it might be like literally like putting out a little bit of food for the birds and then see the goodness that comes from that little intervention. I found it to be very empowering. Love it. I love that. I love it. And you get so much pleasure out of that for a long time, which is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Although now I'm right. on the verge of becoming like one of the weird, like, like cat ladies. I'm going to have like 150 <laughs> bird feeders with different, like I'm experimenting. I'm giving them hamburger, nuts, <laughs> peanut butter, <laughs> coconut oil, and I want to like see what they get. Um, okay. So Jackie, I want to thank you so much for taking oh. time and making space um, for this in the middle of everything else you've got going on creatively. And I want to remind folks who want to learn more from Jackie or about her work, you can do that at heartwoodhealing.com. You can also find Jackie on Facebook. And if you get a chance to check out the, uh, holy crap, I got cancer in the coronavirus comedy show. <laughs> and her baby monk character. You'll see uh, what a multi-talented person Jackie Fletcher is. Anything I'm forgetting, Jackie, or any thoughts I want to leave folks with? No, I think that sounds wonderful. You know, the only other thing is my um, to sign up for my newsletter. If you want to do that, you just go to heartwoodhealing.com slash subscribe. It's kind of hidden back in there and you'll get some free a free video about some of my favorite stress busting techniques. Um, but no, I'd say that that um, I just am always delighted to talk with you. I'm so glad that we've done this. We've interviewed each other back and forth over the years. Um, and it's always so fun. And I love the conversations that we have both on screen and off. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just can't wait until we can go and meet in person somewhere. Yes. Uh, and I just, <laughs> yes, would be so great. And I just want to thank everyone else who's watching this. Uh, I hope that this has been helpful for you. And please don't hesitate to reach out if you need help. So we're here. We're all here to help each other get through this. Oh, thank you so much, Jackie. Yeah. It's been a pleasure talking with you. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Happy experimenting, thank everybody. Thank you. Bye.